Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Total Organic Chemistry. This video, I will be discussing the halogenation of alcohols, and also a little bit on alkyl sulfonates. So by the end of this video, the questions that you should be able to answer are, how do I convert alcohols to alkyl halides? What are the advantages and disadvantages of certain reagents that we can use to do this? How do I synthesize an alkyl sulfonate? And what are the uses of alkyl sulfonates in organic synthesis? So if you're looking for a little bit of review on the properties of alcohols or some of the other reactions that they can undergo, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel and also take a look at some of the other videos I've uploaded on that. If you've seen my previous video on the reactions of alcohols with strong acids, we could look at this reaction, the reaction of this alcohol here with hydrobromic acid and this hydrobromic acid is going to convert that OH group into a bromide but because this is a secondary alcohol we'll actually be forming the carbocation as an intermediate which means that we can actually undergo a hydride shift to form this final product here where we have a tertiary bromide instead of just a simple substitution so if you're confused about how that occurs or if you'd like some review on carbocation rearrangements, please go ahead and take a look at that video at the top of the screen here. So how can we accomplish this conversion without a rearrangement? Let's draw out the same starting material here, the secondary alcohol. And what we'll actually do is treat it with this reagent, phosphorus tribromide. And usually the solvent is an ether, so something like diethyl ether. We've encountered that before. And this will give a pretty good yield of the secondary bromide here without any carbocation rearrangements. So that's very good for us. How does this occur? What is the mechanism? So we start with our alcohol. And we also have our PBr3 reagent. And because of these bromine atoms on the phosphorus, the phosphorus atom will be a little bit electrophilic here. So the lone pairs on the oxygen can go attack that phosphorus. And in a sort of SN2 process, we will kick off one of those bromines to give us this adduct here, where we have the oxygen with a positive formal charge. And then we have the phosphorus bonded to those two bromines here, and also to the oxygen, of course. And now, since the oxygen has a positive formal charge, and it's bonded to that phosphorus, it's going to be a pretty good leaving group. So we can have this bromide here that came off of the phosphorus tribromide, and it will go in in an SN2 mechanism, kick off the oxygen, and we will be left with our alkyl bromide, with no rearrangements, remember, because we haven't formed a carbocation. And also with this HOPBr2 sort of species. And what's good about this reaction is that that species, because it has two additional bromines, can go react with two more molecules of alcohol to form a total of three equivalents of alkyl bromide. And then finally, at the end, we end up with phosphorus acid as our byproduct. Okay, so that's our bromination reaction. Are there similar reagents that can add iodine or chlorine, so other halogens? Well, yes, of course. So we have, we can start with maybe ethanol here, a primary alcohol. And we can this time treat it with red phosphorus, so elemental P, and also elemental iodine, so I2. And this will form the alkyl iodide in very much the same way. And I won't go over the mechanism in detail because what actually ends up occurring is that phosphorus triiodide is formed in situ. So in situ meaning inside the reaction vessel without isolating that reagent because PI3 is very difficult to isolate and store. So it's much easier to just form it in your reaction flask. Okay, so what about chlorination? Well, again, let's do another example, alcohol, this time isopropyl alcohol. And you might think we would use just phosphorus trichlorides, PCl3, but it turns out that PCl3 doesn't give very good yield, and we can use a different reagent 
which is called thionyl chloride. So this is SOCl2. And we also do this reaction in the presence of a base, such as triethylamine, so N at 3. Now I can draw that here. That's just nitrogen with three ethyl groups attached to it. And this will give us the alkyl chloride here, so isopropyl chloride in this case. Okay, so the reaction mechanism is slightly different from the phosphorus reagents. Again, we'll start with our alcohol here. And very similarly to the phosphorus reagents, the lone pairs on the oxygen will attack the sulfur atom here, and then we will kick off one of the chlorine atoms. So in sort of an SN2 process again, to give us a similar adduct, And this time, instead of immediately undergoing the substitution to form the alkyl halide, we will take our organic base, so triethylamine, and we will pull off this hydrogen here from the oxygen with the positive formal charge. So that'll give us this next intermediate here. And now we have another good leaving group. So we have this sulfur sort of group here, and with all the electron withdrawing groups, it's a pretty good leaving group. So what can happen here now is we have the chloride that came off in the first step comes in to attack the electrophilic carbon here. And this time the bond to oxygen will swing up to form a double bond to sulfur. And at the same time, the other chloride will be kicked off. So that will give us the alkyl chloride. And as byproducts, we also end up with sulfur dioxide. So that's our SO2. And that comes off as a gas. It's actually very toxic. So obviously you would be doing every one of these experiments in a fume hood. And then we also form an ammonium salt. So in this case it would be triethyl ammonium chloride. You would usually form something like hydrochloric acid with the one chloride that came off and then also the hydrogen from the intermediate. But since a lot of molecules are acid sensitive and you don't want that to disrupt your reaction, a lot of times we add that organic base in to neutralize the acid as it is formed. Great, so those are some of the reagents that you can use to halogenate alcohols while avoiding some of the problems that we encountered with strong acids, such as carbocation rearrangement, and also obtaining better yields than those strong acids. Another method of synthesizing alkyl halides is by using alkyl sulfonates as intermediates. So to demonstrate that, Let's take a look at, again, just isopropyl alcohol, very simple, very cheap alcohol. And we'll do this in two steps. The first step, we'll be treating it with tosyl chloride and pyridine. So I will draw both of those in a minute. And in the second step, we will add some sodium iodide. So iodide is going to be our nucleophile in the second step. And this will form our alkyl iodide. Okay, so what is actually the mechanism for this? Well, we again, as always, start with our starting material, so isopropyl alcohol. And then we have our tosyl chloride here. And remember, tosyl is toluene sulfonyl. So that's our big toluene group with a sulfonate group on the end. I know I've mentioned tosic acid before, where we have an OH group on that sulfur. But in this case, we're going to have a chloride. So tosyl chloride is where that OH is replaced with just a chlorine. And in this case, very similar to the thionyl chloride we dealt with, the lone pairs on the alcohol oxygen will come to attack the sulfur, and then the chlorine will come off in sort of an SN2 process again. And that gives us this intermediate with the alcohol, and then now it's replaced with the tosyl group. And again, we have oxygen with a positive formal charge because it has these three bonds. And very similarly to the thionyl chloride reaction, we're going to take our organic base. So this is pyridine. And the nitrogen on pyridine will come to pluck off that hydrogen to give us our next intermediate. And this here is our alkyl sulfonate. And alkyl sulfonates are very useful because they are isolable. So they are not as reactive as some of the intermediates we just talked about in the start of the video. And you can actually purify these and isolate them 
which can be a very useful property. Okay, so we've talked about how the tosylate group is a very good leaving group in the past, and that obviously still applies. So we can take our iodide in the second step, where we have our iodide from sodium iodide, and that's our good nucleophile, so it can displace the tosylate group in an SN2 process to give us our final product, the alkyl iodide. And alkyl sulfonates, because they are good leaving groups, can react with a wide variety of nucleophiles. So you can react them with alcohols, uh, thiols, halogens, anything like that. And this is very advantageous for us because the sulfonate, like I said, is a good leaving group, and you can also create them under very mild conditions. Whereas some of the other reagents that we're using, like the phosphorus tribromide or thionyl chloride, are very reactive, and the very strong acids, like hydroiodic acid that we used in the previous video, those are also obviously very reactive and can be dangerous to work with. So sometimes these alkyl sulfonates are a good synthetic pathway to produce our alkyl halides. Okay, that concludes my video on the halogenation of alcohols using other reagents as alternatives to strong acids. Again, thank you very much for watching my channel. If you like this video and learned something, please go ahead and subscribe and also like this video. Please follow me on Facebook at Total Organic Chemistry, and if you are able and willing, consider donating to my Patreon page. Like I always say, that helps me to continue creating these content for all of you.